John Wick has a thing called the Stafford Rule. If you came up with a unique idea, Greg Stafford came up with it first. While the works of Gygax and Arneson might have gotten me into the hobby, I credit Stafford's works with the ideas and thoughts on design, as well as my Exploring Horizons mantra that I continue to try and follow to this day. It's because of that inspiration that I focus on the things outside of the larger companies. There's too much out there not to, as I've said many times. Rest in peace, Greg Stafford. May your legacy live on. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your Gaming Monk for the evening. There's something fascinating about the myriad of interpretations of a given mythos. In many cases, these interpretations are the product of the culture's values therein. That brings us to the interpretations, again, of King Arthur over the years. From personal heroism in the English versions to romantic artisanship of the French to the supernatural affairs from the Welsh. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the modern take to try and balance these aspects. And of course, RPGs are no exception. Bringing us to today's subject, King Arthur Pendragon. Specifically, the 5.2nd edition that was helmed by Greg Stafford after being handled by others for so long. How does it hold up compared to its predecessor? Let's find out. At around 234 pages, the game presents itself very clearly with little in the way of excess clutter. While 99% of it is well organized, it does have some parts where the rules are placed in odd areas. Organization is something that Pendragon has struggled with, and while this entry isn't as bad as earlier instances, there's still some issues. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the later 5.2nd edition does attempt to fix some of these. It's a net positive, but I'd recommend taking some side notes to prevent excess cross-check. Given the sort of game that Pendragon is, starting player characters will be assumed to be vassal knights from Salisbury. This will also be the case with our sample character here, Xavier. Character creation goes within six major steps, the first of which being their personal data. This contains materials such as name, homeland, age, etc. Name aside, Xavier is obviously from Salisbury, raised with a pagan upbringing. He's the only son of a knight named Selevant, and carries that as his title. His liege lord is Sir Roderick, the Earl of Salisbury. When he will become a knight in due time, for the time being he is still a squire. For his manor, we roll a d20 to determine which he's set to inherit. Since we rolled a 17 on that, he'll inherit Winterborn Gunnet. Finally, he's 21 years old, meaning he was born in 465 AD. The second step is traits and passions. These represent a character's inner self, as Arthurian knights are typically depicted as individuals guided by their strength of personality and a bit of larger-than-life aspects. We'll start with traits. There are 13 pairs of traits that act as opposing parts to each other in a virtue-vice formula. The values assigned to those traits are based loosely around the character's religious upbringing. Valorous starts at 15, the religious traits at 13, and the remaining traits at 10. Since Xavier is a pagan, he has a 13 in generous, energetic, honest, lustful, and proud. It should be noted that the value of the opposing traits always adds up to 20, i.e. if one trait has a value rating of 16, its opposite has a rating of 4. Next, we have to assign a famous trait. This is a trait that the character is particularly known for. As such, this trait is rated at 16 and its opposite at 4. In Xavier's case, we'll go with just, meaning arbitrary is rated at 4. The other half of this is, of course, passions, the emotional tendencies within people. As a starting squire, Xavier begins with five passions. Loyalty to their lord, love of family, hospitality, honor, and hatred of Saxons. The first three of these start at 15 while Hatred of Saxon is determined by a 3d6 roll. Xavier's roll in this case was 11. The third step concerns attributes, which are your core physical and mental faculties. You have 60 points to distribute between size, dexterity, strength, constitution, and appearance. After taking into account the minimum values, that leaves us with 32 points remaining. Distributing these results in the following attributes. Size 14, dexterity 10, strength 14, constitution 12, and appearance 10. As a Simic, Xavier's constitution increases by 3, making it 15. Taking these, we can determine his derived attributes, making his damage 5d6, healing rate 4, move rate 2, total hit points 29, and unconscious 7. Since he has an appearance of 10, he gains one distinctive feature that's rolled on a d6. Since he rolled a 2, his feature is tall. The fourth step is skills. 
As a squire, Xavier has the following starting skills. Awareness 5, Voting 1, Compose 1, Courtesy 3, Dancing 2, Fairy Lore 1, Falconry 3, First Aid 10, Flirting 3, Folklore 2, Gaming 3, Heraldry 3, Hunting 2, Intrigue 3, Orate 3, Playing the Harp 3, Read Latin 0, Recognize 3, Religion Pagan 2, Romance 2, Singing 2, Stewardship 2, Swimming 2, and Tourney 2. In addition, his starting combat skills are Battle 10, Horsemanship 10, Sword 10, Lance 10, Spear 6, and Dagger 5. You may customize the skill spread in the following ways. Raise one knightly skill to 15, in our case, Sword. Raise three non-combat skills to 10, here it'll be Religion, Awareness, and Read Latin. Heighten four statistics, either a skill by five or an attribute, trait, or passion by one. We'll increase lance by five, dexterity and size by one, and battle by five. And finally, spend ten points among any skills, which will be four in spear, two in awareness, three in courtesy, and one in read Latin. Finally, we need to calculate their starting glory and equipment. Glory is always one-tenth of their father's glory, which is determined by rolling 6d6 and adding 150. Since Xavier rolled a 24, that makes his father's glory 174, and his glory 17. For equipment, they start with the basic set and may roll a d20 to determine additional belongings. Since Xavier rolled a 10, he starts with a blessed lance. In addition, we roll 1d20 to check for family characteristics, and since he rolled a 6 on that, he gains plus 5 to awareness. As a finishing touch, we determine the knights and other individuals to call to your aid. After rolling the requisites, Xavier has one old knight, four middle-aged knights, five young knights, 14 other lineage men, and 95 levy. Pendragon's character creation is very semi-automatic, for lack of a better term. While this does lead to quick creation, I could see this presenting an issue since the core book assumes characters are from a specific region with specific preset stats. The result is that the characters might be limited in terms of their starting build. And while that's not a deal breaker for me personally, I could see it being a ceiling for character variety eventually. Pendragon uses a slightly modified version of the basic system used by Chaosium. In this case, using a d20 instead of a d100. Regardless, you still roll under a given characteristic. A natural 20 is a critical failure, and a roll that matches the final value is a critical success. If the value to be rolled is higher than 20, you roll as normal with any value above 20 added to the roll result, essentially making it impossible to critically fail. While this might appear counterintuitive, it's best to compare it to blackjack. You're trying to roll under, but as close to the edge as possible. What could throw people off, however, is the lack of an attribute plus skill formula seen often in games. Traits are rolled when acting on instinct, with a success meaning you act in accordance with the trait, and a failure meaning you risk acting in the opposite manner. Passions are rolled similarly, but because they're based on an emotional state that can grant great benefits or mishaps to an action. Combat, on the other hand, is primarily a series of contested rolls where the type of weapon is more important than the weapon's damage. That said, the combat system is a bit lacking in moment-to-moment -moment tactics as written. Also, armor is listed as damage reduction, which has the typical issue of spiking once that reduction is overcome. Made even worse is that because of the damage rate being d6s and doubled on criticals, a character can be done in by wounds or with a lucky shot very easily. Combat is highly lethal here, and to some that might contrast with the themes the game tries to get across. To that end, it's hardly surprising that Stafford admitted to heavily house-ruling his own combat system, and the official forums and other sites are rife with expansions to these rules. One of Pendragon's claim to fame is how each session and or adventure takes place over one year of in-game time. This culminates with the winter phase, a period of extended downtime for a knight. Barring solo scenarios, the first step is experience rolls. Every skill, passion, or trait that you've used may gain a check by the GM. For each of these, you roll a d20. If your result is higher than the value checked, you increase it by one. Second is aging. Normally, you merely age by one year, but when you reach 35, you roll to determine if you suffer attribute loss. If you do, the applicable attributes are reduced by one each time, up to four. If any attribute is at three or less, you're considered bedridden and taken out of active play. When any attribute reaches zero, that character dies. Third is determining your economic circumstance. 
Based on the year's events, this can mean that your standard of living has gone up or down, depending. In any case, your best suit of clothing is reduced to half its normal value. Fourth is the stable roll, in which you roll a d20 to determine the state of your horses. Fifth is the family roll. This only matters if your character marries or has children. If that's the case, a set of d20 rolls are used to determine the wife's rank, her dowry, glory awarded, and the state of any children born, if any. If any family events occur, a further d20 roll is issued here. Sixth is training and practice, which allows changes to attributes, skills, traits, and passions. You may either gain 1d6 plus 1 skill points with a cap of 15, one point in a skill at a 20 cap, or increase an attribute, trait, or passion by 1, at a cap of 19 for traits and a cap of 20 for passions. Finally, the addition of glory, which includes glory from play, from traits or passions that are rated 16 or higher, and from holding a castle. For every 1,000 glory you gain, you can raise an attribute, trait, skill, or passion by one. The winter phase slowly wearing away your character might make this a bit of a hard sell, depending on the players involved, but to me it ties into the overall themes of the game. Pendragon aims to be one type of game, and it does it mostly well. It maintains the premise of Arthurian knights and ladies, with a nice midway point between game, narrative, and simulation. However, its biggest problem is both organization, even with the improvements, and a combat system that can get a bit swingy. Furthermore, this is a long-haul kind of game with its yearly format, so I'd advise against running it for conventions or one-shots. Even with those gripes, I feel confident that I could give the game a stamp of recommended with one significant caveat. If you can get the gore book and the Great Pendragon campaign in a bundle, aim for that, especially if it has the 5.2 edition, which is the most organized. If after a few sessions you want to delve more into it, I'd recommend adding in the Book of Knights and Ladies to expand character creation options, and possibly the Book of Battle if you want to expand on the combat system. Either way, Pendragon is a game of dynastic epics, and I'd say it earns its reputation in spades so long as you take it on its terms and don't put it in a realm it's not designed for. Oh yeah, and no Monty Python jokes, please. Those get annoying real quick.